Hey everyone, welcome to the Bay Area Content Marketing Meetup, where we're meeting every Thursday at this time, noon Pacific, here online. Today, we are joined by Amanda Milligan. Amanda is Marketing Director at Fractal. She's going to talk about a subject that I love, how content marketing and PR earns you backlinks, media coverage, and brand awareness. Amanda, thanks for joining. Take it away. Thanks so much for inviting me to be here, everyone. I've stopped in a few times. I wish I could join more of them. Um, this is my favorite subject. I can talk forever about it. So I'm looking forward to any questions you have at the end. Um, like Dennis said, I work at Fractal. I've been there for six years, maybe. Um, and I've done like everything you can do there. I was doing the projects myself. I was an account strategist and now I market the agency itself. So it's been a lot of fun getting to do the work and now talk about doing the work. But essentially what the agency does is help companies achieve more organic growth through content. And the way that uh, the specific strategy I want to talk about today is using data journalism and digital PR together to get some of the best backlinks you can get. It's really difficult to get these, these links otherwise using other strategies. So uh, this is the type of coverage I'm talking about. Usually I ask people uh, what your dream publication is and maybe in the, in the chat box you can send where, where would you always dream that your brand would be mentioned? Um, and those types of things are actually achievable with this strategy. So these are publications where we've gotten our clients listed before and this could be nationals but it can also be something more relevant to your industry right it could be something that's a little more niche and more targeted for the audience that you're trying to go for and like i mentioned the overall strategy here that i'll break down is a combination of content marketing but not just any content marketing because that content marketing is a gigantic umbrella term for any kind of content right i'm talking about creating something that's newsworthy. So la launching your own surveys, conducting your own studies using data that exists online or using internal data or doing any or other sort of like experiment or analysis to create something that's brand new and using that information, uh, packaging it in a way that's compelling and easy to understand and then pitching it to publications. So I'm gonna talk quickly about both parts of that, the creation of the content and the pitching of that content. And then if you want to dive into anything in particular at the end, I'm happy to go into more detail. So when you do this strategy, when you have this amazing content and you pitch it correctly, you get responses like this. You are not doing this to try to spam writers or send out 100 emails and hope that one of them replies you're actually trying to provide value to them. You're saying, I did my research. I did a really good job creating this content. I know that your audience is going to like it. And they appreciate that at the end of the day because you're helping them fill their editorial calendar. So that's why we do this type of work. And not only do you get the coverage, it's very authoritative coverage. Uh, I have some examples here of how the brand ends up being referenced. It's not just an ad or something sponsored or, or throwaway mention. It's really usually really high in the story, sometimes in the subhead and it links to you and it says a study done by or a survey conducted by and you're the primary source and you're the lead. So it's another major benefit that's actually not talked about very often with this type of strategy is that you get a lot of the authority that comes from being mentioned in this way, coming up with this new information and then being talked about by credible publishers. If you do this over time, so not if you do this on a one-off, if you do it once in a while, if you do it over time, make it a, a strategy that you incorporate into your content marketing. These are the types of results that we've seen for our clients because not only building awareness of your brand because you're being mentioned in major publications, you're building the authority that I talked about and you're building these backlinks to your site from really high authority sites. So all these things compound, especially over time. They, the backlinks will elevate the authority of your site overall. So all of your on-site content is elevated and everything just compounds. It's a beautiful thing. <laughs> over time, you really start to see the impact of all this together. So part one is actually just creating this content, right? How do you create something that is worthy of being mentioned by some of these publications? And this is the, the first half of the battle. 
So I have some things here on this slide about kind of what we believe in, in terms of link building. Um, and a lot of it goes back to, like I said, being newsworthy and being data driven, but to simplify things a little bit, I'm breaking it down into the three parts of this triangle. Surprise, being widely appealing and using original data. So I'm gonna to speak to each one of these things. And then if people have questions at the end, I can get into a, a little bit more detail about what I mean. But the first one is the element of surprise. Uh, we did a study, God, it was several years ago now, but it was on the Harvard Business Review where we took all of the top viral images of that year. I think that imager had as like the top 50 images. And we surveyed people asking what emotions they identified with each of those images. And what we found was that surprise and anticipation, as you can see here, were two of the most popularly uh, appearing emotions from these images. So we have really incorporated that into our strategy and it makes kind of, it makes intuitive sense, right? Like if something shocks you or surprises you, you're probably more likely to engage with it and share it with people. But I do want to note that overall, that means like positive emotions can be successful. I think going into this, I had this expectation that it was going to be negative. Negative stuff was going to outweigh the positive and be shared more and, and get people's attention. But positive has its place. And I think, especially now during COVID, there is a lot of room for some positivity and it's really appreciated. So uh, in general, even if your information isn't surprising, you want to make sure there's an emotional component to it. And you want to think about that from the very first part of the process, which is coming up with your ideas, literally write down what emotions are associated with this and just tunnel into that, figure out why they're going to have be impacted by it. Even if you kind of know to really write it down and have it as a focal point will help you make sure all the decisions you make after that will align with the emotional component, because that's going to be huge for the end result, making sure that they're actually interested in it. But surprise in particular showed up the most uh, in, in the viral content that we studied. So when I say surprise, here are some example headlines of content that we placed in the media. Um, one in 10 people have ended a friendship over social media content. So again, you're taking data that you collected from a survey or a study. And actually what we'll do is try to imagine what headlines we want out of that. Even when we just come up with the idea, we hypothetically sit there and think, what are the resulting headlines we think will come out of doing this? And that's how you can start to hone what is the angle that I'm going for? What kind of questions should I even ask? Um, you know, the ink one here is not as direct. It's like kind of leading you into reading it. There are some behaviors that your boss hates and you should read them to make sure you don't do them. Um, so it's like kind of surprising to know that there are 10 things you probably shouldn't do at work. It doesn't have to always be a ton of shock and awe but something that is new to somebody and, and stirs their attention is really good to have. Um, you can see here is another example and you see the publishers use this, this language. You're kind of helping them get their own introductions to be exciting when you provide them with exciting information or disturbing in this case, it reveals a very disturbing statistic that 22% of Americans are willing to sell their social security number for cash. It's like, whoa, I did not know that that was a thing. So when you have a data point like that, you're like, okay, I'm onto something because that, that is kind of shocking and not okay. Uh, and you'll use that in your promotions later, which I'll get to. But think about this element. Obviously, when you start something, you're not going to know exactly what you're going to get. And you don't want to spin it at the, at the end you're just trying to anticipate, is this something that could lead to something surprising? Have some hypotheses and have some of those headlines uh, that you anticipate maybe being able to, to pitch or that you'll see in the media. And that helps you at least narrow down which ideas have the most potential. They won't always go exactly how you think, but the, the potential and even just deciding what idea to move forward with is some of the hardest part. So the second part of this, widely appealing, so we had to kind of come up with our own phrase for this at Fractal because we talk about it all the time and we didn't know how to, how to talk about it easily. And we call it tangential content. And what I mean by tangential content is it's in kind of opposition with topical. So it's not something that's very on brand. Tangential content is not addressing your product or service or in line with like your core, core branding. The reason why we do that is because especially when you're pitching to publications, 
not all the time, but a lot of the time, if you're too self-serving, if you're basically talking about your own product or service, uh, the, the publishers aren't going to really want to talk about your study because they're thinking it's an ad and they want you to pay for it. Uh, so especially if you're trying to get top tier coverage, you want to go nationally, you want to appeal to a wider audience anyway. You don't want to appeal to just your very specific target audience. You're trying to get your brand name out there, just broader recognition and better links. So you, you zoom out a little bit and that's basically how tangential content ideation goes. So say, for example, one of our clients was porch.com. So this would be like our, our thought process for porch.com. They do home repair. So they help you find contractors to fix up your house or to move. And we did do content around that. We had some great pieces that were very topical. They were about the cost of home improvement and those did well, but we couldn't only talk about that forever. Plus there's only so much information out there about that. So when we decided, okay, we wanna do tangential content, zoom out a little bit, do some things that are relevant and still interesting to this audience without being directly tied to the brand. We first zoom out. So we say, okay, home repair, the general category is home, right? If you're thinking about the top categories that appear on publications, home lifestyle would probably be the overarching topics. Then you take that overarching topic and you think, what are the other subtopics associated with it? In this case, you know, family, outdoors, your backyard, cooking, living arrangements, relationships. You can really, when you think about the home, there are so many things that can be factored in. So I have this as an example, but I recommend if you're interested in, in pursuing this type of strategy that you first zoom out, what is your broader category? And what are some other subtopics in that category that would be of interest to people who are already in your audience? So these are a bunch of headlines that are kind of all over the map. What they have in common is that they're all projects that we did for porch.com. So this first one for Bustle, uh, it was about people who like what they want to do in their home. Do they want to be home buddies or do they want to go out like the introvert extrovert thing? Like this is what people prefer to do in the house. Uh, Motley Fool is about the cost of living uh, for kit for adult children <laughs> or not adult children, uh, but you know what I mean? Adults living with their parents. Um, so you see the tie in there. It's like they're moving home. Um, how to manage your... Uh, what is this, your biggest distractions when working from home? So working from home, another tangential topic related to this. And then also we did the one at the Toronto Sun was about um, like manners. This is the headline they decided to run with. They picked a stat from the whole study, but uh, it was about manners and manners in the digital age. So it was about uh, how people get along with each other. So that ties to the relationship side. So as you can see, we hit a lot of different, we have finance in here and lifestyle. We hit a lot of different stuff because we zoomed out and we could get on a bunch of different publications with uh, tangential content. So if you have something that's surprising and tangential, the final thing that I keep referring to is having something that's newsworthy and original. So this is an example of some kind of methodologies you can use. Surveys are really common. Um, internal data is often overlooked. I think a lot of companies have really interesting data that they don't realize is interesting because they deal with it every day. But if it's something that only you have and it could be of interest to your target audience or shine a light on a topic in your industry that nobody else can, certainly utilize that. Not only, it, it also doubles as even more authoritative because it's coming from you originally. Um, scraping social media. We've done a lot of projects where we've analyzed sentiment and, and the popularity of things by looking at Twitter and Instagram posts. Um, a lot of different websites have APIs you can tap into. Government sources, there are so many public uh, data sources that the government offers in a million capacities. We've actually done lab testing. We've swabbed different things. So we've checked for air quality. We've checked for the, the, one of our most viral campaigns ever was Years ago, we swabbed uh, airplanes to see what the dirtiest part of airplanes were. And that still gets coverage to this day because no one else has done it. Nobody else has since then uh, checked. <laughs> so it remains the most authoritative study out there. By the way, it's the tray table. So be careful of the tray table when we're flying again. Um, and then Google Trends. So there's also tools that already offer information, but it's finding new ways to utilize them or combining that with something else. So taking a, a tool that already exists and maybe 
cross -re referencing it with something else. Something we do often are indexes. So if you have this thing in your head, like again, with the, with the travel topic, I think once we also did the worst airports, the best and worst airports, and you decide what criteria would be involved with deciding that. Uh, maybe it's like the number of delays or how crowded the airport is or whatever. And as long as you spell out the methodology and you have a sound way of determining it, then you have something new where you see those top 10 lists or worst 10 lists all the time, like best places to live or what have you. So kind of coming up with one that makes sense for your industry can be a really good way to go. So here are some examples of headlines that illustrate the original data side of things. Um, and they tie in with that appealing angle. Like you said, companies, this is why your employees are stealing from you. You're like, whoa, like I need to read about that. Uh, you know, we literally survey people and ask them if they've ever stolen something from their company. And if so, why? That's compelling. It's, it, it's interesting to survey people about things you can't figure out otherwise. It's like the same reason I get sucked into Reddit because people are weirdly uh, honest when they're anonymous. <laughs> um, then on CNBC, the job at the highest pay right now, like this is what it makes out of school. So that's just like an interesting stat that's out there, but people aren't distilling it. That's uh, a key thing. There is a ton of information out there. And even though it exists, that doesn't mean that people are casually Googling these data sets and scrolling through them to figure out the insights they want us to do it for them. So you can find this data and ask yourself a question about it and say, does this question, is this question answered very succinctly anywhere? And if the answer is no, that is a huge opportunity. Take that opportunity to distill it yourself, illustrate it very clearly in a graphic and a write-up and uh, present it and people will appreciate you for that. So these are just some of the examples of, of the end results of taking this kind of approach. Uh, so here's another more specific example like in the story and they even frame it like Boxboat, our client wanted to know the real challenges remote workers face. So they're even saying like, this is why we went ahead and did this. Uh, we surveyed a thousand full-time workers to see if they preferred face-to-face -face interaction or technology. So this is an example of something during COVID-19 where there are so many new questions that come up, right? And that's, we, that's what we kind of leveraged. We were, we were wondering, what are things that people are asking and how can we answer that for them in a way that makes sense? You know, I, I'm wondering, other people are wondering, you can do updated keyword research to see what types of stuff people are asking. And then asking yourself how you can answer it for them using data or surveying. So that was part one <laughs> and I went through it very quickly. So happy to answer any questions at the end. But this is part two, uh, pitching the media. So once you have this awesome content, and I didn't even really get into the whole like, okay, once you have the data analysis and you can use, a lot of people use Tableau, you can use tools like Flourish as well to analyze the data. Um, once you have that, we usually create like very straightforward graphics uh, along with a write-up that gives context to all of those findings. And we publish that. Once you have that, then it's time to actually pitch the media to get these links, okay? So... I'm showing you this tweet because we got it a couple weeks ago and it hits on like, she loved this pitch she received. Becky's at uh, PR Daily. And she outlined like everything I was already planning to talk about. And I was like, well, this, this just kind of backs up what I was going to say. This is what writers appreciate when you're able to do it, being personal and being relevant, which I'll get into. But this is the perfect example of what you should do. So the first thing, arguably the most important, is to pitch the right people. So last year, we surveyed 500 publishers. And we've done this before because it was very useful. And we updated it last year because we literally wanted to ask these writers, how do you want to be pitched? How do you appreciate being pitched? We can speculate and we can test and testing is good. <laughs> but we just figured we would ask them. And a lot of people took it. And we actually got a lot of great insights from it. And one of the more stunning things is this is the top 10 biggest pet peeves that they had. The top two are about being pitched the, the wrong stuff. The person either just did not understand their beat well enough or they didn't understand the publication well enough. So that signals to me that a lot of pitches are still kind of crap, which is good news in the way that when you do this correctly, you'll probably still stand out enough. 
Um, but the bad news is it probably turns journalists off to pitches in general when most of them are missing the mark or a lot of them, at least I won't say most. So knowing who to pitch is extremely important and I'll explain exactly what that means. So first that your publisher aligns with your goals. So this is even separate from how the writers do it, but this is for you. If you have a more specific kind of SEO link building goal, that might look a little different strategically than if you just want brand awareness with a certain group of people. So there are certain things to factor in when you're prioritizing different publishers. Uh, if you're prioritizing link building, does the website have a high domain authority? Are they an, a, an authority or whatever metric you want to use? Um, and do they provide do follow links? You know, some sites like Forbes are only no follow. No follow has its value, sure. But if you're only focusing on do follow links, you should know whether the site even offers do follow links when they link to studies. Um, when you're just primarily seeking engagement or awareness, uh, you should know if their stories get traction on social. So you can use tools like BuzzSumo to see what their top performing articles have been, how often do they happen, was their top performing article like years ago, you know, narrow it down to this year, see what, what's going on. Uh, otherwise it might not be worth it to you. And finally, if your goal is to reach a certain audience, you can use tools like SparkToro. And this is what Rand Fishkin's talking a lot about where he's trying to help people get to specific audiences. If you're like, I'm only doing this to, to reach a very particular audience, then you should know if the audience actually is reading this publication that you're targeting. So there's a lot of overlap here. You can get a lot of these things all at the same time, but it helps you uh, narrow down who you're targeting and even the type of content you're going to be creating when you think about it from like, what is my real like top goal and what are my supplementary goals? But then it's also about the writer. You can't stop at the publisher. It's good to have your list of publishers, have an idea of where you want to pitch, but it's actually, I mean, it's a writer that you're pitching. It's a person on the other end. So you need to understand, firstly, how often are they publishing stories at this publication? If they're publishing stories once a month, uh, you're less likely to get coverage than if they're publishing every other day, right? If they have like a ton of editorial uh, spaces and they need stuff, they're probably more likely to read your pitch than somebody who writes you know, once every month or two they most likely already have something queued up. Um, then knowing their exact niche. What I mean by that is I described earlier how there's general topic areas. So like home and sports and finance, people don't generally just cover like finance. They usually have something a little more specific than that. For example, maybe you're, you're targeting a sports writer and you have a sports story, but maybe that writer actually only talks about sports in conjunction with psychology. And if you pitch them something that's not relevant to the psychology and sports, they're going to be like, they did the bare minimum. They don't know what I actually talk about. They're probably not going to open any of your future pitches. So really make sure that the niche is actually identified. Um, sometimes they'll even say in their Twitter profile, like what they talk about, that's good to check. But if not, really look at what they've published and, and ask yourself what it has in common. Just because it's all within the sports section of the site doesn't mean that they cover anything sports related. Um, do they even mention external surveys and studies? Do they just write columns? Is it all based on their own opinion or internal information or hard news? Make sure that they talk about the sort of thing that you're pitching. And similarly, do they include graphics, videos, interactives? You're pitching um, a more robust product, something that's not a product, but like something that you created that's a little more intense. Can they even host that kind of stuff? Do they ever host that kind of stuff? So all things you should check before you even pitch somebody. Uh, and this will help. I know it sounds like a lot of work. It is, frankly, you have to do the research here, but you'll get better results and you'll start building better relationships with writers when you're not pitching them stuff that hasn't been researched enough. So after you kind of have a sense of who you're pitching, when you're crafting your email, you have to make sure it's succinct. Uh, part of the survey we asked the same survey, we asked them, how long do you prefer the, the email to be when you're pitched? Like, do you want it to be really uh, comprehensive and explain everything about it? As you can see here, most of them don't want more than 200 words. So when you're writing your pitch, you might as well just check the word count. And if you're over, be like, mm, does all of this need to be here? How can I make this more clear? Which should be there, 
is firstly personalization, which is the next point that I'll get to. But after that, a very straightforward explanation as to why you're pitching them. Uh, you know, I think your audience will really enjoy X, Y, Z. And these are the top insights, bullet point, bullet point, bullet point, re directly relating to their audience. It's not something you're copying and pasting to everyone you're pitching. Okay, so that's that should be your email. And like I said, you should personalize it because you're sending an email to a human being who is getting all kinds of emails in their inbox and they're probably sick of getting pitched. So if you speak to them like a person, you're probably more likely to have your email opened and read. So there's a few ways to do this. Uh, the, the best one, which is the least common, is if you've ever collaborated with somebody at their site before. If a couple of years ago, somebody else at your company wrote something for them or they covered something of yours, it's good to reference that. Like, hey, you know, you talked about us a couple of years ago, I'm following up because you were interested then, maybe you'd be interested now. If that's not the case, which it often isn't, um, just reacting to an article that they wrote recently. It shows that you actually did the research and read some of their past stuff, but don't be too you know, contrived with this. Actually respond to something in a genuine way. Like I really liked that you wrote about X, Y, and Z and I relate to it. Uh, additionally, the third way is if you follow them on Twitter, which you should, if you're like targeting a writer who fits your beat really well, you should follow them. Uh, and there's something you have in common. You can reference something that you saw recently, a tweet that they had, something in their bio that you relate to. As you can see in the, in the example I had earlier, that Nicole uh, appealed to Becky because of a love of dogs, right? Like they just talked about their love of dogs and that was fun for them. You know, add a little bit of fun into somebody's inbox, they'll appreciate it, trust me. So those are a few ways you can add a little bit of a personal touch. And this is like a sentence or two. This isn't four paragraphs about how much you love their work or you know gushing or anything, but just to add a little bit more personality and a little bit more of a, of a human aspect to this whole process. So I just ran through a lot very quickly. Um, I wanted to leave time for, for questions because I'm happy to dive into anything more specifically. If you have questions after this, that's my email address and you can find me on Twitter at uh, Melanda. Um, like I said, I work at Fractal. I talk endlessly about any of these topics in depth. So please ask any questions that you have. And thank you so much for, for coming and listening. Yeah, that's Amanda, great. Amanda, so I have a question. Oh, have a question. Go ahead. Um, I'm wondering what you think about um, your company following different writers online versus just you personally following them. That's interesting. Um, I mean, it, again, like, I don't think there's anything wrong with it. I think it's just more human to have like an individual person. I think they're more likely to remember, uh, you know, or connect with a person than a brand. I think if you're just trying to get to know them and you're just following them on your on your brand account, that's fine. But if you're ever gonna like be liking and, and you know tweeting and stuff, I think people just inherently will connect more with a with another person than um, with a brand. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. I'm just seeing uh, some of the chats in here. Yeah, the trade table. Um, I have one question. Mm-hmm. Uh, yeah, so I was wondering if you have like maybe one or two pictures that you could show us so that we could get a fair idea of what an actual email pitch would look like uh, that might have worked well maybe sometime in the past for you guys. Yeah, I don't have one like on me, but if you shoot me an email, right. um, at yeah, Amanda, yeah. At, mm -hmm. yeah, send me an email and remind me. Generally, what they look like is like that structure that I'm talking about, though. It's like a sentence or two. Um, yeah. where like I pitched HBR recently to try to be on their podcast and they said no kindly, but they were like, we loved your pitch. I'm like, Hey, I'll take it. <laughs> I'll take it. Somebody <laughs> said my pitch. And basically all I said right. was like, I did the pet angle as well. She was, I saw on her Twitter that she loved cats and I have a cat and I had this adorable picture of my cat in my office chair. And I was just like, Hey, I love your kid. Like this tweet about your cats. This is my cat. And she was like, Oh my God, I loved your pitch. It made me so happy, you know, whatever. So that mm -hmm. just a sentence or two personalization. And then you, you basically say, this is the project link to the project. Don't do the thing where you okay. ask, like, do you want to see the project? Because don't okay. make them take an extra step. 
Um, right. you know, we did, we surveyed a thousand people. This is what we found. Bullet point, bullet point, bullet point, wrap up and, and close it. But yeah, if you send me yeah. an email, um, I'll, I'll, can, I can get you something. Oh, definitely. I'll do that. Thank you. Okay, sure. Another and, uh, one of the that you mentioned was taking an existing study and then doing some analysis on it and coming up with an original angle. Mm -hmm. Do you ever feel like from either an ethical or legal perspective that you have to go back to whoever performed the original study to make sure that you're not crossing any lines? So it's not usually like a study that you're reanalyzing. It's a data set that's publicly available. So like the gov like government resources, they're just putting data out there. It's, it's just like spreadsheets, right? It's not like it's, somebody hasn't already performed the analysis and then you're using that. I think if you are doing something like that, then yeah, it would be good to ask for permission or, or say something. But a lot of the times, a lot of companies like Zillow and stuff, like, I don't know what their permissions are. They're probably more strict. So you might have to ask. Um, but like government sources are, uh, you can just use the information and you're the one doing the analysis of it and it's publicly available anyway. So I always, no matter what, we have like a robust methodology section that says exactly what you did and you link back to what the data source was and you know make it very clear how you came up with it. You don't wanna like pretend that you came up with this data or collected it somehow on your own. But yeah, to, to clarify, it's a great point. It's not like an actual study that's been done that you're kind of utilizing. It's, oh, this data set exists, but nobody's really like taking anything from this because we haven't distilled it into something that makes sense. Um, that's kind of what I'm referring to. Okay, thanks. And, and may that I? Makes more oh, sense. I would like to ask a question too to follow up on that. Are you using this to, um, like, in a news release and putting it out there on behalf of the client? Or are you just pitching a reporter and connecting that client with the information? Yeah, great question. So we're not doing, Fractal doesn't do press releases. Okay. Um, press releases have their place for sure. But in this case, like I think press releases are often really good for any kind of like big company changes or product or service updates or events. This strategy is actually really good for all the in-between moments. So when there's a lull and there isn't anything major happening, it's like you're creating your own information. So the way, what we do when clients hire us, we do all of it on their behalf. So we're not even like, connecting them to the writer. We're speaking on their behalf. We're saying we did this study with them, but we don't, we're not getting like, we did it on their behalf and we pitched individual writers saying, we think you and your audience are gonna be interested in this. And that's the way that we execute it. Okay, thank you. Sure. Any other questions? So how about establishing the relationship on social media first? and maybe even, <clears throat> maybe even pitching on social media rather than relying on email. Yeah, so I definitely think if this is somebody who you long-term wanna be pitching, you definitely can follow them on social and, and start engaging them as people, right? And I, we have tagged people and been like, hey, what's the best email to reach you? I'm like trying to send you something, you know? <laughs> like that's, that's a way to connect. I still think people prefer to be pitched via email generally. Um, so even then we're asking like, how can we send you an email to, to get this to you? Just because they're, that's when they're in their work mode, right? They're checking their email to be pitched something, but certainly using social media as a way to just connect with them, uh, get on their radar, understand what they're covering and reach out to them if you have spe uh, specific questions, I think could be really effective. Makes sense. I have a question. Um, are you pitching from your client's email or does the writer know that you are a PR firm pitching them? Yeah, that's another great question. I think you can do it both ways, but the way that we actually do it is we just use our own emails and we make it clear, like that's part of the pitch. So it's like, uh, we don't say like our study, we say an office, you know, like whatever uh, brand, like porch.com uh, porch survey, you know, with porch.com said X, Y, Z. And uh, there have been times though, where people have misattributed us and we've had to go back and be like, hey, like, thanks for covering this, but we're not the ones uh, who wrote this. Um, 
So we do do it from our own emails. And a lot of writers are used to this. Like they, yeah. they know that this is how it goes. They know that people have PR consultants or agencies and they, they get it. So it happens seldomly that it's confusing, but um, yeah, you can really do it either way. And are you pitching print? No, okay. no, we don't pitch print. We've had things go live in print for <laughs> just, they decide like, oh, this is going to run in print. We're like, okay. Mostly just because people are hiring us for, for digital growth, like we're digital inbound focused and a lot of people want the links. So print is good for awareness, obviously, and authority. Um, but a lot of our clients have the SEO edge to them as well. Other questions, feel free to unmute yourself or use the chat. I had a question, Amanda. Mm -hmm. do you do you, on pitching, do you ever use a checked, check LinkedIn, common connections on LinkedIn as either way to reference the connection? I have not done that, but I can see that being a good tactic. Yeah, like just trying to find a way like, hey, I know you, you know, we have this person in common. And that's like an example of a, some kind of a personal connection, right? Like right. if you don't really have anything, you can't, some people are just, MIA online or you know, the Twitter's not very informative or whatever, whatever it, you can find that you might be able to relate to them with. Um, okay. Or even um, if your common connection is a good friend of yours, you message them and saying, how well do you know such and such person and see if they yes. can make an intro for you. Yes, that, that would be ideal. <laughs> yeah. well, LinkedIn used to have a mechanism where you could ask for an introduction from like a like a first level connection to maybe a second or third level connection because it wouldn't let you connect unless you knew had the email of that person i don't know if that's still the case or if they've changed it yeah i'm not sure either i haven't looked at that in a while <laughs> michelle I know you, you hope that everyone has a very robust Twitter profile, but it's not always the case. Not always. Amanda, you mentioned um, for link building, do follow versus no follow. Is that, is, has there been any change from the search engines on how they interpret those, those tags on links or is it? Oh God, there was the so much debate about this on SEO Twitter that uh, I think it depends on who you ask. We've always thought that there was value to no follow just because to, I, I guess I think that Google has to know that you're, they're at least being referenced. So in terms of like your authority, it might not be as powerful obviously as a do follow. Um, but you know, now that they're saying, uh, what month was that? I have no idea what time is it like how much time has elapsed anymore. But when Google kind of came out, we're like, yeah, we use it as like kind of a signal. It's not a ranking factor or anything, but it's like kind of like a, an indication. People were saying, okay, maybe no follow actually is being counted in some way or another. But as we know, Google's not extremely forthright with how much things uh, account for how they rank. But to me, even text attribution type stuff, not ideal. You obviously like, would prefer the link and get the traffic, but any mentions, just like social, uh, is ultimately a good thing, just on different levels of good. Right. I like that. Different levels of good. Because <laughs> yeah. if Premier Pre I mean, if if think of a class, if Google sees your brand name out there, it's gonna it's it's cataloged. It, it it's maybe not giving you the same juice back to your website. But right. it knows it's there. It sees it. That's what I, that's what we've always said. It's like, there's no way that Google's like completely ignoring the fact that you're being mentioned, especially if it's like an authoritative site. Um, you know, and people talk about like Forbes as the example, it's like they never give do follow links. I'm like, it's still like any publication that people respect being mentioned there has to mean something like no matter what the publication is. Um, so yeah, I agree about no follow. I don't think it's like the crisis that a lot of people assign to it, but uh I'm just thinking the print days where you got a brand mentioned, your your name's in there, you're you're right. you're ecstatic, right? So. Right. Well, it's a really um, big improvement for top of the funnel if you're just out in the world being referenced, and it's hard. The the problem is, and this is what a lot of people face, and this is what my podcast is about through Fractal. It's like getting buy-in for this type of work. Um, so if you listen to podcasts, it's called Cashing in on Content Marketing, um, and Dennis has been on there actually. So. 
uh, it's hard to prove the value of getting some of this uh, some of this media coverage sometimes if you're not like on just the SEO side and the link building side. Uh, sometimes it's actually a great way to, to say you did something like in the short term, like, look, we're on CNN and everyone's like, yay. But some that's some work environments. Other work environments are like, so what? Like, where's the money? And you're like, well, <laughs> that's not how it works. You can't just like go from here to a ton of money. Um, but it all compounds like the awareness. You can track things like how many times you're mentioned organically, naturally, after you're kind of appearing in media publications, people might start reaching out to you. I mean, that's happened with me personally in marketing. People have seen me speak at different things or write different things and they'll reach out and be like, hey, can you give us a quote for this? I'm like, oh, that's new. Like, I didn't even have to do anything. Um, that happens with brands as well. Uh, you're, you're out there more and more, you're building your authority and suddenly somebody has a question or thinks about they want a product and they, and they come to you. So it's hard to measure and I understand that issue, but it definitely is still impactful. And being able to tell that story to your boss or your clients can make a huge difference. Amanda, what's your in. take? Go Sorry. Go ahead. Go ahead. Okay. Go. Uh, right. Thank you. Uh, yeah, I was asking, what's your take on uh, tools like Harrow? Uh, do you think uh, they work well when it comes to pitches to larger publications like Forbes and others that you mentioned? It's certainly, I mean, some people like build their whole strategy around Harrow. Um, I think, especially if you're like a smaller team, if you're like, if you're a person who's tasked with this by yourself, then yeah, like it's definitely a good route to subscribe to that and keep an eye on it. Um, yes, thank you, Dennis. Help a reporter out if you Google that. Um, no, <laughs> no, Michelle, I agree. Um, I think if you're like a smaller team, Harrow is like really effective, but it's like really effective within a certain limit. Like you're not going to get a ton out of that. It's going to be kind of like a an every now and then type of win, right? That doesn't mean it's not a good thing, but uh, it's good to be more proactive. And that's more about kind of like building yourself as an authority. So if you have like a, a somebody who's leadership in your company and you want them to build their authority in a space and answer questions about a topic, it's really good for that. This strategy that I'm talking about is like you're creating content. You can be pitching people that rather than just waiting for somebody to have a question. Um, and you get the benefit of having this great content anyway on your site, right? And you can repackage that in a million ways. You can share it on social or create a spin-off event or do like several guest posts. Like when you create this whole data package, it has that, that extra benefit of like, okay, how many, how many ways can I repackage this and use it? Hi. That was a lot, lot of chat about a uh, Harrow going on here. Oh, a medium post. Yeah, I actually have only used it a few times personally. Like we've, we've looked at it um, on some marketing stuff and, and have reached out a few times, but I, so I don't have a ton of personal experience with it. I've only used it seldomly, but I just know that there are some people who do it all the time. So Amanda, I'm curious, how do you handle cases where the coverage is um, presented in a way that's counter to your, your, the way you wanted the research covered or the brand. So it's not like, it's not very, what am I trying to say? It's not great coverage. It's like counter to your objective for having them cover it. Mm, yeah. So it's funny because again, I'm agency side. So we've had a ton of different clients and some are like more open to being a little more controversial and taking that risk of like, we don't know exactly because you won't and that's the, the the risk here but it's not a risk unless you make controversial content if you're doing stuff like i showed you on here it's it's very unlikely that anything's going to be mentioned in a way however uh for the clients who are willing to get a little more controversial you can get a lot of links <laughs> if uh, if it goes well <laughs> because uh i mean almost everybody wants to talk about it um you do risk your brand being associated with something negative um the only other thing to think about is like, <laughs> if you have any affiliations with anybody. So if you're in a bigger company and you don't know that maybe in this other department, like some company sponsoring something and you don't want to tick them off or whatever, and it somehow ends up in your content, you have to be very aware of that. But again, that's only if you're like trying to push the envelope a little and be like, how can we be edgier and tackle something that's a little more taboo? However, the payoff is pretty massive. Um, 
if you do take that risk. So I wouldn't recommend it if you're just starting out or unless you hire like an agency that's done it before. But if you're, if you're doing this on your own, I would start maybe a little, <laughs> a little less controversial to see how it goes. But we haven't had it if for things that are kind of like standard or even if they're surprising, you know, the, the brand is still seen as like the source of the information. And then you have to gauge your sensitivity to like some big companies have more trouble with this. So like, we don't want to even be remotely related to anything on this topic, but you'll know that pretty early on. You won't even move forward with the, with the idea. If, Amanda, if you get an article and you like the coverage, but it doesn't give you the backlink, is it okay to follow up and ask for uh, an edit to include a backlink? Yeah, so um, we have this whole strategy actually called rink, link reclamation, which there's a whole post on Search Engine Journal about that if you wanna read all of it. But the short answer is yes. If somebody you've corresponded with posts it, you know, say, hey, thank you so much for covering this. I'm so glad you think it's going to be, you know, worth it for your audience. Um, do you mind giving us credit by linking to the landing page? So that's what we call it, or the project so that people can read more if they're interested. Send that, but the, don't harp on it after that. You know, a lot of the time they'll be like, oh yeah, sorry. And they, you know, just didn't realize whether editor took it out or whatever. Um, or they'll say, no, we can't. And then you just kind of have to like, you know, live with that. Um, but yeah, I think it's fine to ask once like, hey, you know, in case somebody's like interested in what you presented and want to look at it more, can you add the link in? That's a good question. Thank you. I think we have time for one more question. If anyone has one, you can feel free to use the chat as well. Todd has a comment about Google changes. Actually, Amanda, any tips on how to stay current on Google algorithm changes? Oh, God. <laughs> <laughs> we could do another, another uh, session well, on this. <laughs> you know, the simple answer is just to be creating things that are just good regardless, because what's always going to be valuable is that you're creating stuff that people want to read and uh, want to link to. So at the end of the day, if you're doing that, I wouldn't worry too much. Um, but yeah, anything, anything more than that, you get into like technical SEO type stuff and then it gets <laughs> get complicated. But that's what I've always said. It's like, you know, it's a separate, long story short, the way we work at Fractal is we, we bucket content in two different ways. We call it either rank worthy or link worthy. So I'm talking about link worthy stuff. So this is stuff specifically to get media coverage. Rank worthy is our more on-site type of stuff that's really useful to people. We're trying to rank in Google because we're trying to provide value. Um, so that would be more impactful, you know, like the day-to-day the -day Google al algorithm changes for that sort of thing. But even still, Google's inherent goal is to try to rank the best thing. So you just need to be trying to create the best thing. And that's, that's like the, the simplest answer. Makes sense. And one last time, Amanda, for folks who want to get in touch with you or Fractal, remind us how to do that. Yeah, so you can email me at, here, I'll even type it in. <laughs> it's easier, because I'm like, it's like, it's Amanda at frac.tl, which is a little weird. Uh, that's my email address. Send me an email with any questions. And then I'm at Twitter, I'm Amanda, and I'm on LinkedIn. Those are my three major places. And like I said, we have a podcast called Cashing In on Content Marketing. Um, that's specifically about how to get buy-in for content initiatives or measure the results of your initiative. So understanding what the value is of what you're doing and being able to communicate that. So if you're interested in that, uh, sign up for the podcast because we've had some some great guests actually todd you were recommended as from somebody to be on the show so <laughs> i meant to reach out to you to see if you wanted to come on um at the end of every episode really nice people... some... yeah would. somebody yeah, was like todd that was really nice <laughs> not to, to put you on the spot you can you can chat me later but <laughs> i was like todd oh, i know no. todd yeah somebody told it and said oh todd would be a great guest on the show well good to meet maybe you maybe it was you michelle <laughs> <laughs> i did i never even heard of your blog you know of your podcast until today so i was i made a oh, minute nice. to go check it out yeah, yeah michelle's been on it too we've had some some great people on there um so yeah 
thank you all for coming and listening. I can ramble on for a long time. So please reach out if you have any questions. Thanks so much, Amanda. That was a great presentation. And um, so, yeah, thanks everyone for attending and we'll be back next week. Yes. Take care, everyone. Take care. Thanks, Amanda. Stay Thank safe. you. Thanks, all. Thank you. Bye.